Thank you so much for joining us again. This is Mentor Us Live. And today we have a very exciting and interesting gentleman who's joining us. The man who has been creating digital artwork, animation, editing, and doing all these crazy things in Zimbabwe for the past 11 years. Most know him, and those that are serious about their craft know and have used him. Ladies and gentlemen, let's go straight into it, and let's learn more about the creative side of Ngo. How are you? I'm good, man. How are you doing? I'm excited to have you here. No, thank you for having me, man. Yeah. You know, when you have someone like you on set, it's kind of difficult, you know, because we took a very long time trying to make everything look perfect. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> but thank you so much for, you know, gracing us today. Right. No, no we want to know about you. Mm -hmm. You've gotten six awards over 11 years. Yeah. You have transformed and lectured over 100 people in terms of animation. Right. You've actually lectured for a year in Rwanda. Was this always something you knew you were gonna be ever since birth? Um, you know, the lectureship bit was, was something I discovered a bit later. Um, I knew definitely I wanted to be in some level of digital art or animation. It was always a passion. You know, I used to read a lot of comics, watch a lot of cartoons, like a lot of cartoons. So, so cartoons are actually healthy for young people? I think so, yeah, yes. they were healthy for me. <laughs> <laughs> they still are. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, okay. for sure. <laughs> But yeah, that's, you know, so I, I always had just a, a healthy appetite for that. And I used to draw all the time. So I used to do the school comics um, for the school papers, as well as just, you know, ones that we produce ourselves, my friends with a bunch of, you know, uh, copy machines and things like that. But yeah, uh, you know, I've always been that guy, so. Obviously your craft has evolved over the years. There was no, fo I think maybe, uh, no Photoshop, Adobe, like 11 or plus years ago. Well, how, what did you do in order to, like... Yeah, yeah. you know, um, funny enough, there was Photoshop, but it was a very early version of Photoshop. I started when there was Photoshop 4, and I didn't even start with Photoshop. I started with something else called PaintShop Pro and um, got into web design okay. and um, just used a bunch of different abstract applications till I met this guy who came down from Harare to Blawayo, to the public library where I used to work at the internet cafe there because I didn't have a computer at home. Yeah. So, because my dad refused to buy me one. <laughs> but anyway, um, so yeah, well, he gave me a piece of software called 3D Studio Max, which was animation, installed it. I thought it was awesome. And then he gave me um, the number for a graphic design college in Harare, and like, you should call these guys. And, and I did. <laughs> That's how I got started. <laughs> and tell me, you said uh, your dad never actually supported. Like, clearly, you know. At, uh, first, at, first. at first, of course, like, uh, they would, probably just think that this is cartoons, you're enjoying books, you should be studying, <laughs> you yeah. know. And did you go to school for this, like, within that period? Um, so, um, I only went to school when I got to Harare, which is why I came to Harare. So I came to graphic design school, so it wasn't really animation school. It was the closest, but it had an animation module inside. So I came uh, here to a school called Ziva, and there I met my first um, mentor figure, it was called um, Professor Saki Mafundikwa. He's written a book about African alphabets and he really changed, you know, my thinking in, in terms of the Afrocentric approach to, to everything. So um, that's what that college did. But while I was there, I met, you know, Alex Lindsay, who's my more technical animation production mentor uh, out in California. So I met him here through that, through that school. And um, yeah, it was, it was only there that I started really um, getting a lot of animation, like specific, uh, animation specific training. Uh, but I'd already started teaching myself a bit of that, but it was, you know, I got more acceleration, I guess, when Alex, when I met Alex. And currently we can safely say that you are, you've, you are holding the market in terms of animation with a hit series, Angry Moana. <laughs> Tell me, what's the, what was the inspiration for that? You know, Angry Moana, there's always a kid that you know who's, you know, who's always got a really short temper, he's always, always pissed off. So I had a few nephews, uh, nieces like that. So, you know, that's where it, it came from. And it was really just uh, me and a couple of friends just sort of fooling around um, with voices. And then we're like, hey, let's do this little animation skit for a web show that we started off with uh, when we started the company in Afuna. And um, yeah, that skit was popular. And then we expanded on it, um, then did the, I think it was like a pilot, uh, season of like four episodes, which really looked horrible now that I watch them now, but <laughs> but yeah, that's how we started that off. And you know, 
Um, and just that we wanted to have a series, you know, we wanted to have a show just like Simpsons, Family Guy, I grew up watching these, you know, so as an animator, you want to like, hey, I want to I do a show do like, that. like that. Yeah, so that's what we did. <laughs>so we, so we have a lot of um, our businesses multifaceted, uh, right? So we have the direct to, to client business, which provides our main revenue stream, but we also uh, you know, create a lot of internal projects that one day mature into um, projects that could pros uh, possibly be profitable. So Angrimano was one such project where we started internally, we sort of started growing it a bit, and then started trying to craft business models around it. So whatever um, sort of internal ideas that we have, we have to be able to put some kind of business model around it to hopefully, potentially, make money from it later, even if we don't make money from it now as we invest in it, but that we can possibly make money from it later for sure. So it has to have some kind of business model that, or some kind of way that it can make money, you know, yeah. Mm -hmm. And you were in three employment places before you sat down and said, you know what, I have to birth my own business. Yeah. What, was, what are the key things that you picked up from your employees back then? Um, you know, I think with regards to lecturing, because um, was, that was my first real job, which um, I was given right after I graduated. And I taught 3D at Ziva for pretty much five, five to six years. And what that teaches you is to um, study and learn quickly, you know. So before you, you're able to teach anyone else, it forces you to be an academic yourself. So that's really what Ziva taught me. Um, then I went on to my ideas where I uh, was creative director for a lot of uh, advertising campaigns. So that taught me, you know, the, um, the more advertising business -y side of things. Um, yeah, that was, and that, and that was pretty great for me as well. Um, then I also had a job at the Pixel Core, which, um, which is my mentor's company. In that one, I, you know, it was more, I'd create more lecturing videos or more educational videos. But at the same time, I'd do like actual commercial work for an American company, which, you know, I think, you know, um, sort of helped broaden my expectations and horizons a bit um, with regards to when I eventually started my own company. Um, that job at Pixelco had me then go to Rwanda as a lecturer there for, for a college. Um, I was there for about a year, then, yeah, then I eventually came back <laughs> and started Nafuna. <laughs> and is there a future? Would you think that Zimbabwe is ready for uh, digital animation? Or oh, digital design. Yeah, I think the whole of Africa is ready for that, man. Like it's not just Zimbabwe. Definitely, given you know just the trends and what's going on globally, social media has become such a, a, a huge phenomenon. It's become the norm now. It's no longer something special that you talk about. Um, so definitely, being able to design for that audience and create content for that audience that you can deliver to your audience directly, without the bureaucracy of going through a traditional TV station and you know, it, it, it opens up the, the, the playing ground a bit. So this is, this is the time, certainly, yeah, I think so. And like you said that wherever you had your employee phase, as well as whenever your life upgraded, you mentioned that there was a form of a mentor. Mm. Like we go crazy when we hear the word mentor. <laughs> <laughs> what were the benefits? What, what would you not have grasped if you didn't have mentors in your life? Right, I think mentors kind of help your overall um, thought development, you know, um, just your process and how you think. So with um, Professor Saki Mafundiko, definitely I learned an iterative creative process where the first thing is never the final. 
like he's one to humble you very quickly. Like <laughs> you come with what you think is a badass design and yeah. he's like, no, go again. You need to do this like 20 more times before, you know, we only take the 20th version. So definitely from him, I learned that sort of iterative process. The first idea, no matter how good it may look, is never really the idea. It's always like, you know, how, how many times can we put this through the process till it gets better and better and better and better, you know? So from Alex, um, which is the pixel core um, angle, definitely a more very rigorous technical discipline. Um, and, you know, uh, being able to operate just at a very high level um, with regards to just whatever undertaking of digital production, you know, to try to learn it not just for the paycheck, but learn it because it's cool, you know, <laughs> as a way of life. <laughs> yeah, mentorship, we, we really value mentorship. And um, I believe that our audience is learning much from this. But as you, as you would also know, of course, you're in the industry. Um, anything that has a creative to it, it, it demands a lot of sacrifice. Yeah. You know, what, what, what things had you, did you have to sacrifice in order to get to where you are now? You know, there's a lot of time. You know, it takes a lot of time. Like, um, just, you know, the amount of just software, the amount of process, processes on a technical level, it just requires a lot of time to be able to learn the kind of things you need to learn to deliver really high quality or competitive work, you know. So that just takes a lot of time. Then the creative process alone is not an easy one, you know. Sometimes a client can come and give you a job, you don't have the inspiration right there and then. You have to go through the process still, there's a process of discovery, so that also consumes a lot of time. So you've got every aspect of it just takes a lot of time, you know. So you're always doing all-nighters, so it's a lot of time. That's the biggest sacrifice, I think, with regards to creativity <laughs> or creative work. You know, they say that uh, our generation, the millennial generation, does not like working. <laughs> and with, within the students, but we, we always try to um, remove that misconception because I feel that we really do work. And you've taught hundreds of uh, young people. Would you say that this is a norm? What, what weaknesses have you identified within them that have nothing to do with creativity? You know, I think it's um, mainly an information overload thing, you know? When you've got information as you're growing up being fed to you um, by way of advertising, by way of people's opinions, movies, cartoons, animations, you have this information overload so that when you're, such that when you're grown, you don't actively look for information. You know, the information that's already readily available to you begins to be acceptable, you know. So, and sometimes that's not necessarily the information that's going to get you to the next level in life, you know. So sometimes you have to proactively, you know, I feel the newer generation doesn't proactively try to self-develop. Um, everything is done on an emotional level, which has its advantages, but certainly does has its disadvantages as well, because a certain amount of reason and logic is still important <laughs> for the just function, you know, at the end of the day. So, uh, in as much as we want to not kill anyone's dreams and we want to dream to be the highest thing, we need to understand that the amount of work that it takes to achieve that is still significant, and <laughs> it's no joke, you know. So, yeah, so with the dream, you know, you have to just marry that with with the things on the ground, you know. And you definitely have a dream with uh, Nafuna uh, TV, which is, as I mentioned before, the biggest and sought after uh, digital design organization currently in Zim. How do you transfer your passion, your vision, your dream to your, to your team, your employees? Yeah, you know, that's, that's so difficult. Um, and one of the challenges I didn't expect you know, when I was like, hey, let me start a company, it's going to be cool, you know, we're going to do cartoons all day and we're going to get paid for it. <laughs> like, that was, I want to be hired. <laughs> right? But then when it gets down to actually working in an organization where, you know, you're no longer the only person there, there's different people, they have different thinking, they've got different habits, I've got a certain rigorous habit that I'm used to that has proved to work over years, and there's you know, someone joins the company and they don't have that. They've got a different habit. They've, you know, they've got a different, you know, workflow. Yeah. And then, you know, so it's hard to sort of get everyone to work on the same page. It's hard to transfer a work ethic. You know, if someone doesn't internally have that, like, <laughs> so, it, you know, it's been a process of a lot of trial and error. But um, definitely my, the main thing I do with staff hires or just people who join the organization is just always look for people who are sort of self-motivated. They know what they want to do in life. They, they're already passionate about what they're doing. All, all I'm really doing now is sort of redirecting that passion yeah. in a coordinated way to try to get you know, everyone paid. Like, <laughs> that's my job. Like, 
but yeah, that's I you mean, know. You truly are a creative, aren't you? <laughs> yeah. Like, <laughs> through, and they say through. entrepreneurs are born to. They have this innate mm-hmm. shout to satisfy needs. Like mm-hmm. uh, obviously, when you created Nafuna, there's something you identify within our society. You say, you know, this is what I want to solve. Yeah. What's 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 uh, Nafuna's mission? You know, my, Nafuna's mission, in a nutshell, is to reimagine Africa. And we do that by trying to create content that we feel will reimagine us. The reason that we feel that way is because Africa has been fed to us. The narrative of Africa has been fed to us by non-Africans, right? So I've grown up with Africans watching movies where Africans have been cast in a certain role that I don't necessarily agree with. Um, I've been growing up in a society that has fed me, you know, religious symbols in the wrong race than what technically the race is supposed to look like. I don't want to point any fingers. But, um, and and then I've grown up looking at Africa being portrayed as, you know, starving kids with uh, big bloated bellies, and that's all we have to offer. But when I looked at my immediate surroundings, that's not what I saw. Um, So our immediate thing is to show a different side of Africa and say, hey, you know, these images are not, <laughs> you know, all we have to show. We've got these other cool images. And we feel it starts at that level of media, you know, that level of, you know, my daughter being able to watch a cartoon that looks like her okay. and uh, that talks like her, yeah. you know, and not having to adopt, uh, adapt, okay. you know, that you don't have to adapt to watching a cartoon made for a different audience with different, you know, uh, with, 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 who, who doesn't look like you. You can relate to them. They've got long flowing hair. It's not drawn kinky like yours. It's, your skin is brown. It's not, it's not pale like theirs. You know, the storylines are different. The environment's different. So creating content right from that level, you know, right from that level where kids begin to relate to that and not have an inferiority complex because media teaches them to have that. If we start our kids off on that note and then start producing content that makes Africa look cool, they don't have to aspire to use America as a standard because we have our own, you know. So that's really what Nafuna's goal and mission is, I guess. And the response with our audience uh, currently, because it's rather unfortunate. Um, in Africa, we, uh, we follow trends. And as you're saying, that we have been led to believe that uh, whether it's Western, you know, European uh, trends, names and tags, uh, the it thing. How have you uh, innovated your works to grasp the folks to come back in? Like, I mean, you've got two million views. It's not easy to get two million people. Yeah, so two million people is just on Angry Man alone. And the reason for that is, um, you, know, you know, it's a little backstory, and I'll be quick with this one. So, no, it's okay, take your time. Um, I just finished doing a music video for a certain hip hop artist, you know, I want to name names. Yeah. Then, um, as I'm editing this video, I'm getting a call from Winky D, right? So yeah. Winky D is like, hey, I want you to do my new video. I've got this awesome song, it's called Vashakavu. I'm like, oh, awesome, Winky D? Like, I'm the biggest fan, like, <laughs> you know, bring this thing. So anyways, Winky comes, we, we do this video. Hip-hop video comes out, you know, you know the hip-hop artists have to, like, tweet this thing every, like, three, three, three times a day. They are, they are pushing this thing down our throats and get to 25,000 views in, like, four months. Winky tweets this this video of his once. It lapped those guys like two days, right? So I started analyzing, I'm like, it's the same director, I'm the same director, I haven't changed, I didn't change my approach with both videos. What changed? Winky was a, a brand that resonated with the people. The reason he got the views, the reason his video had more engagement is because he delivered his content in vernacular, people understood that. It was cool, it was hip, he had nice slang, um, and it topically, he, he spoke about stuff that I related to. That's why he's, he occupies more space on my playlist than a lot of other different artists locally. And what I did is that I took that thinking and that sort of formula and I applied it to animation. And I said, let's create an animation, whatever it is. It has to talk in vernacular. It, it, it has to be cool, it has to be trendy. It has to talk about topics that we all talk about and we all relate to. Okay. It mustn't be an out of body experience. It has to be local. And if you do that, the views will come the people who follow it, it'll, it'll develop a following because it looks and talks like them. Okay. The moment we did that, that's exactly what happened. Like, <laughs> but it was a lesson we learned from Wiki D. Like, oh, wow. <laughs> you know, so it was, yeah. So that's you know, literally. What you're saying is so, so amazing. Mm-hmm. 
witches kind of maybe believe that it's not actually our audience that's got a problem. It's maybe us as entrepreneurs, creatives, as yeah. musicians yeah. who are trying to import uh, yeah. all these other cultures into us and we complain that our people are not following. Yeah. So we definitely need to just get real with ourselves, eh? Yeah, and understand our market. Yeah. We just need to understand the market. Once you understand the market, they'll, <laughs> you'll design the exact thing that they want, you know? <laughs> and uh, talking of market, um, what are some of your marketing strategies with your product? Um, you know, we, you know, Nafuna is a very, I guess, complex animal um, because our environment is complex, you know, so yeah. we don't typically operate in the same environment as typical startups like ours would. Um, to just get a camera at Nafuna is, we have to jump several bits of hurdles, you know, ar you know around little um, challenges like that. But um, definitely when it comes to marketing, our marketing is very content centric. We create the backbone of Nafuna is that we create um, original, high quality, engaging, entertaining content. We've created approximately 200 videos now online, um, and these are all original videos on our, you know, on our YouTube channels. And that's literally what's made the brand grow. You know, it's 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 no complex rocket science. We put out stories that people liked. You know, they you know they share it, and our brand just started getting impressions in all these different areas. Um, to such a degree that sometimes even clients we talk to would have already consumed a large part of our videos that we didn't charge them for. You know, so by the time we, we work with a lot of people or partner with a lot of projects, um, it's typically because people have already resonated with content we'd have put out maybe even three, four years before. So, you know, a lot of collaborations that we're even working on now are based on, you know, people only tell me now, like, maybe after we seal a deal, like, you know, that thing you did back then was so awesome. I really, like, you know, like, wow, you guys watched that? Like, <laughs> you know, so creating high quality content is, is, is really been the, the sole backbone of our marketing strategy. Yeah, and content, I think a lot of people tend to um, reduce their quality. They just want to get the stuff out and make the quick buck. Mm -hmm. In terms of uh, your organization, when did you actually say, look, we're st well, now we're making money? You know, um, the very first thing we focused on, and I focused on, was creating a company that made high quality product. Like the, the quality of the product was more important to me than making a lot of money. So when I started the company, um, I was the sole employee for you know, a couple of years. And you'll find that I lived I lived a very pauper's life, you know, during that. So there was no money back then, <laughs> you know. Um, uh, they say fake it till you make it. Fake, yeah, we were faking it till we make it. So, um, it, but the quality was the biggest concern. And once I feel we got that correct, and it resonated in a number of different symptoms. You mentioned awards, there's views, there's different ways you can measure that. But, um, but having the good quality sort of then would attract, because people like quality, then it attracted the right kind of people because of the quality, you know? And then only then, when we started, then I guess associating with really big brands that I never thought I'd associate with, and I realized, hey, you know, this is cool. Like, I, I wouldn't exactly say we're paid, paid, paid. Um, for a company where I'm the oldest employee, um, <laughs> you know, because everyone, like, my company is full of millennials. Like, like the, you know, I think the youngest guy, the youngest person is probably 17. And you know, going through the the next uh, the next president, you know, maybe twenty nine. Well, they're about age, young people. Worry. Yeah, <laughs> but I'm just saying that for a, for a company that's largely run by young people, yeah. what, I wouldn't say we're doing too bad, but we you know we're definitely looking forward to try to do way better. <laughs> Let's say that. <laughs> and you know, you you're talking about big corporates. You've attracted them with your quality. Uh, I, I, I have to kind of ask this because I, I believe that a lot of young people are complaining that the elder generation, which is of course not the millennials, they don't give us enough respect. When they kind of do, they say, look, hey, you know, come, bring your stuff. We'll give you exposure. Yeah. You know, pay your rent. We don't pay with exposure. How then did you manage to, you know, put your foot down and get your respect within the industry? It's a fight, man. Like, I, I, I wouldn't want to, you know, um, create a delusion and make it look like it's a walk in the park. It's not. That thing is a very real reality. You do have people condescend and talk down on you purely based on um, age, you know, um, not based on anything performance-based, not based on quality of work. You know, they'll have that attitude simply because they're a couple of years older, you know. Um, so that's a very big problem. Um, 
for me, the, the whole thing has been to stick to my guns with regards to quality, with regards to uh, the kind of work we put out, and let that speak for us, you know? Um, at the end of the day, that's all people pay attention to. Yeah. So, um, and for, ev for anyone else who's facing that, that's really all you have to do. That's, you know, that's going to be there. You can't, you can't avoid it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, when people are getting a certain type of age and they're, some of them are losing certain relevances, it comes off weird to a different generation. Um, and you just have to, you know, you have to develop a very thick skin and expect that. Like, when I came out, I had a lot of criticism levied against me by the older generations in my industry. Yeah, they're like, oh, this guy, he does, he's not classically trained, he's not this. I, you know, I've heard all, all sorts from a generation that was ahead of me. But you have to just stick in your skin and say, hey, with what I'm trying to do and my vision and what I'm trying to accomplish, you know, this works for me. So, you know, and then stick to your guns. Sticking to your guns. <laughs> you know what, no, we're just going to take a short break. And uh, to the audience, we are going to be back in a short moment. Zone on. 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 Can I the internet in not so fire? In Ukwanisa, kutamba my games, ku streamer, kana kuona my videos. Subscribe ni Zo Fibronics. Ino shika kwese kwese in Zimbabwe. Isinga buy is we ne weather nepo kana kunai. Treat yourself to the fastest internet in Zimbabwe. Zol Fibronics. You deserve to live like this. Hashtag Fibronics Fast. Welcome back. This is Bento Us Live. And tonight we are joined by one of the greatest creatives within Zimbabwe. Animator, illustrator, digital designer. He's everything. He's made one of the coolest cartoons, Angry Mwana. And if you watch cartoons like I do, you'd probably know it. <laughs> no, okay. I've got a burning question. Something I wanted, I wanted to ask you from the beginning. Okay, six awards, and thousands, thousands of people coming through your hands, teaching and training, two million views on Angry Moana. You definitely, definitely should have a moment where you made a huge mistake, but overcame it. <laughs> Tell us about it. Okay, so, okay, so this will be a funny story. And, um, yeah. So at, at, at one point, um, several years ago, I think it was about a year into the company, okay. um, I started getting a call from Ja Prazer, a very younger Ja Prazer at the time. It was his first album, but he started getting a the lot of ja traction. Prazer. The Ja Prazer, like wow. the, as in the biggest artist in this country. Yeah. And I didn't know who he was, because I, I, I just, you know, I listened to Lincoln Park and so forth. I didn't know this guy, <laughs> right? So anyways, I started blowing this guy off for like a week or two. Tilly calls me and I'm with a friend of mine and my friend hears that I'm talking to Ja Prazer and he's the biggest fan. And there's a producer as well, he's just flipping out, like we need to go see Ja Prazer right now. So, you know, we drop everything we're doing, like, okay, let's, let me go see Ja Prazer. We go, we have a meeting with him and his management. But, you know, who was very visibly quite annoyed at the fact that I'd been blowing them oh off all God. this time. So, but, you know, you know, on the way there, my friend is giving me like the debriefing sessions, like, this is guy, you know, this Jaffrey is the guy, he's the biggest artist in Zimbabwe right now. He's going to be the best. This album is the biggest thing. Don't you know this song? Don't you know this thing? And I'm like, no, I don't know anything. <laughs> And so you're getting in a quiet passion. Like, oh, and I'm like, okay. yeah, and I'm like trying to, you know, I'm, I'm trying to get this information. I'm trying to figure it out. I'm getting there. I'm realizing this crew's already quite, you know, not, yeah. not, not, not very happy. <laughs> they just say we didn't get a call back and they didn't, we didn't do their videos Ooh, at the end. Shame. And, you know, you know, like, oh, man. And then, so now he's, you know, quite bigger and, you know, fantastic brand. I'm like, oh, man, it's the, the guy I blew off. Oh, man. So that was one of them. The second one was Toki Vibes as well. That happened, like Toki came by, he's like, yo, you did Winky D's video, or I need a video. And I was like, I don't know this kid. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> like I, I don't do free video. <laughs> and at the time, we had a lot of, you know, just financial pressure. It was, you know, uh, it was that 2013 semi-recession. And we're trying to, you know, we're trying to balance a lot of projects, you know. So trying to do a free video for this dude who, who I didn't know wasn't really... And he blew up, it's like talking about like, oh, like, oh man. Nah, and you know, I called him up like, I called him up like after I'm like, yeah, you blew up. He's like, yeah, you and Dada, Mama Sigan, you believe him. <laughs> <laughs> he told me that. So those were two very big mistakes. And these days when a new artist calls me, I, I'm very careful and I listen very attentively. <laughs> oh, no wonder our calls were taken so quick. Yes, sir. Like, hi, I am this. I know who you are. How are you? Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. No, no, these kind of lessons, they're really, really... Um, they build us up, you know. But in terms of like, uh, besides direct mentorship into your life and your organization, what, what organizations you look up to, whether local or international? 
Africans? Mm. What have you taken from them? Yeah. I think local, definitely, I have to say, and not because we've worked together before in the past, but definitely Econet, and especially the Zol brand. Like, this is a very well-oiled machine um, on a corporate level. Um, and I just like, you know, the way they market. Um, I like the backstory um, of, the, of the founder. You know, I'm a big Strive Monsieur fan. Um, so, yeah, locally, like, I think definitely my go-to company for, you know, what I consider success, you know. Internationally, surprisingly, that's changed. Um, it used to be Pixar, which is the biggest animation company, but now it's become IBM. Um, and this is because, you know, um, in, in, you know, in this past few months, I was fortunate enough to be picked for Yali. And while I was in, um, Cal not California, but um, Atlanta, um, one of the big um, IBM guys came to give us like a two-day lecture on um, just different aspects of entrepreneurship. And I had a chance to ask, you know, because I had burning IBM questions, like, what happened to your business model? Why did you sell off Lenovo, your, your laptop division to Lenovo? Why did you do all these things? Yeah. And, you know, he explained, like, no, 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 we, we decided to, you know, uh, pivot, become a totally different company. We're now a big data company. We, bought, we recently bought the weather company, which is weird. And, yeah, you know, yeah, they why? pendulumed. It just became this totally different thing. They developed an AI now called Watson, which is one of the smartest artificial intelligence. And it's like how they move from what their business model was to adapt to the current market and still stay relevant and yeah. still, be, you know, stay as one of America's top 10 companies. Like, it's amazing. Like, after like 40 years, like, it's tough, you know? Oh. So, yeah, definitely um, in the top there for me. And just... Un Understanding how they did that was, was, was you know, I, I think they're geniuses. <laughs> and in terms of reinvention, as we possibly, like, uh, unfortunately have to close up, in terms of reinvention, um, the Nofuna brand, <clears throat> you may not be within it, um, not because of your lack of passion, but bigger projects, perhaps you might leave the country, be associated with bigger corporates out there. How... Um, I'd rather say, what is going to be your, your plan, your long-term plan in terms of keeping the brand alive? Yeah, definitely the long-term plan is decentralization, away from me, you know, and that, that plan has already started. Um, so there are certain aspects of the project. Believe it or not, you know, people keep giving me the sandals of Angry Moana. I actually don't run that anymore. It's oh, run really? by, yeah, it's totally run by an actual Angry Moana division. Um, I also watch them half the time a day before everyone else does and get excited like, wow, this is awesome. This episode is great. <laughs> so, but definitely it's important for uh, me to not be central and the bottleneck to some of these processes. So definitely sort of um, decentralizing um, the company in such a way that it runs autonomously without me okay. is definitely a big, huge, huge concern um, because, um, you know, I'm, I'm an artist first and foremost before an entrepreneur, a businessman. So I want to go back and spend more time, you know, being an artist. So the sooner I get the businessy parts of it tied up and I can step away, the better for me, you know. <laughs> then I can go back to animating full time and, um, you know, whether I shoot a movie or something or whatever the case may be. But um, definitely that's a big part of uh, where we're going. And definitely we're angling towards technology. So um, you'll see some games from us very soon. So game, game dev and interactive design is a huge part of where we're going so a lot of vr augmented reality type um products should be on the way as well so that's where we're going in the in the long term that's so yeah and in terms of um you nafuna has got a, a campus yeah yeah totally so um the campus is our educational and mentorship program um, basically we get um, students that come in from the top universities in the country um mainly from nast from uh, CUT, which is the Chinoy University of Technology, um, MSU from their media and film divisions. Um, just to name a few, there's from Ziva as well, where I used to lecture. We have, in fact, um, two of the staff members <laughs> are <laughs> ex-Ziva students. Um, and so, so, we, so we get a lot of students from there, and we also get a lot of students from the industry, practicing people in ad agencies, different design studios, who want to increase their skills in animation, digital design, video production. So um, yeah, so we still extend that um, sort of lecturing and training aspect um, through, through that Nafuna campus uh, platform. So we've had people come in sometimes a short period of a week, sometimes as long as a year or a year and a half um, under our mentorship. So um, that's a really big aspect of um, where we are because animation is a team sport, so we need more animators. So we try to do our part to make more. <laughs> you know, it's, that is so amazing, man.
That is really inspiring. And uh, <clears throat> I like that you've already got a campus going on. I think you, uh, you'd know that uh, Mentros has got what we call My Pledge, where our mentees, our mentors, uh, are going to pledge time. So I believe that a lot of our audience, you're going to get an opportunity to interact uh, with Mo and uh, learn the deeper things that he would not say in front of the camera. But I'm so excited and uh, we're very grateful for you uh, being on the show tonight. Well, thank you for having me. I believe we've learned a lot. <laughs> Hope so. Yeah, definitely cartoons are okay. You can watch cartoons, yeah. <laughs> you know, um, parents, especially parents. <laughs> yeah, but thank you so much for sparing your time. I know you've got such a busy schedule and you're planning on uh, releasing a movie in the yes. next couple of years. Yes, yes, the Angry Mana movie will be coming out soon. <laughs> Featuring yours truly. <laughs> <laughs> Voices, talents, yeah. I, I want to be in there, you know. <laughs> but thank you so much for making time. Mm -hmm. We're definitely going to be following you on your uh, media platforms and uh, keeping in touch, you know. But thank you so much to the audience for being with us tonight. I believe tonight was such a creatively astounding evening. Let's meet again as we get more guests on our next episode. This is Mentor Us Live. Have a beautiful evening.